Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And welcome to Carnegie Connects, a virtual conversation on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. And I must say today's discussion, a world in peril, is truly global in scale. Three or four months into this pandemic, I think it's clear or should be clear to most of us that COVID-19 is not just a headline, um, it's really a trend line. And amidst all the uncertainties that surround us, uh, one thing I think is pretty certain that this virus or perhaps its successors in some form may be with us for some time to come. Infectious diseases kill more humans on this planet, I believe, than any other single cause. And two thirds um, of the newly discovered pathogens in, in this world are viruses. We've already had three significant flu pandemics since the, jo since the great influenza of 1918, subject of John Barry's book. 1957, 1958, which killed 116,000 Americans, 1968, 100,000, and now COVID-19 in four months has passed tragically that 100,000 plus mark. And maybe it's somehow understandable that in our rush to escape this nightmare and get back to normal, over the course of the last couple of decades, we've suffered, I think, from a sort of pandemic attention deficit disorder. In the last 20 years, we've seen a kind of boom and bust cycle when it comes to planning for these sorts of challenges. Fran Townsend, who was uh, George W. Bush's uh, Homeland Security Advisor on this program, described how in 2005, after reading John Barry's book, uh, President Bush uh, started intensifying pandemic planning built on the Clinton emergency stockpile, developed in, uh, an early warning system, et cetera. But even under Barack Obama, who got high marks for dealing with Ebola and Zika, spending on public health was cut. And you know, the, the reality is it wasn't as if we lacked intelligence warnings or frankly, even the resources to deal with the, the potential of a pandemic. Let me just read briefly from the 2019 DNI's Worldwide Threat Assessment. Quote, we assess that the United States and the world will remain vulnerable to the next flu pandemic or large scale outbreak of a contagious disease that could lead to massive rates of death and disability, severely affecting the world economy, straining international relations and resources and increasing calls on the United States for support. And when you think about the fact that we spent billions of dollars since 9-11 on counterterrorism and paltry sums on public health, I think we probably would all agree we need a sort of new definition of what constitutes homeland security, including on climate. Uh, one last point. Um, COVID, to quote the environmentalist Adam Sweden, was what he described as a black elephant. It's a mix between a black swan, an unanticipated event, and an elephant in the room syndrome, a recognizable but looming crisis that nobody wanted to address. And I think, frankly, that's pretty accurate. SARS, MERS, Ebola, Zika, COVID, they're all wake-up calls. The real question, are we going to go back to sleep? Um, as usual, I have many more questions than answers, but fortunately, and truly fortunately, we have three extraordinary presenters to unpack them. John Barry, and I have to say this, uh, uh, that with respect to his bio, that he's a formal football co former football coach at a high school, small college, and major college level. He's a professor at the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine and a New York Times bestselling author of the 2004 The Great Influenza, which won the National Academy of Sciences Book of the Year or in Science and Medicine. His book on the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 won the Society of American Historians Francis Parkman Prize, and John has been intimately involved in public policy matters on pandemic preparation and water throughout his career. We're also honored uh, to have uh, Harvey Feinberg here today, 
MD, PhD, president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Um, Harvey served as president of the US Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, provost at Harvard, dean of Harvard, of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, author of several books, including The Epidemic That Never Was, and fortunate for Carnegie, he is a trustee. And finally, uh, we have Kathleen Sibelius, uh, currently CEO of Sibelius Resources, a former governor of the state of Kansas. And I might add, if I'm correct, uh, Kathleen, the only daughter of a governor, John Gilligan, from my state of Ohio, to actually serve as governor. And the 21st secretary of, of HHS under Barack Obama between 2009 and 2014. Secretary Sibelius is one of the nation's foremost experts on national and global health issues, human services, and executive leadership. So each speaker will speak for five minutes. I may politely interrupt if they go over. We'll do a moderated round of discussion with me and then to your Q&A. So uh, John, I wonder if uh, I'll cede the virtual space to you first. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I'm uh, flat, very flattered to uh, be in this August con company, and I, I mean that for an ex-football coach, it's quite, quite an event. Uh, give you a brief summary of uh, history and where we are now. Uh, both the 1918 virus and COVID-19, of course, a lot of similarities. Uh, they're both respiratory viruses. Uh, we're discovering that both of them, uh, however, in fact, many other organs create uh, many complexities for, for medicine. Uh, they transmit essentially exactly the same way. Uh, there are significant differences. 1918 was much more lethal. Uh, if you adjust for population, the death toll uh, from 1918 would equal probably uh, 220 to 440 million people today. So even a worse case for COVID-19 would not the equivalent to that, fortunately. Uh, COVID-19, however, is seems to be much more contagious. Uh, it's much more stable, much slower mutation rate. That's very important in terms of developing a vaccine. That's a, that's a very good thing. Uh, maybe another very significant difference is uh, influenza moves much faster. The incubation period is one to four days. Uh, people are generally fully recovered after uh, six, seven, eight days. Uh, this virus is COVID-19, as we know, two to 14 days. Uh, the disease lasts longer. Uh, you shed virus longer. Um, and in addition, when influenza invades a, a particular community, uh, generally moves through that community in six to 10 weeks. Uh, the 1918 pandemic lasted about two years but two thirds of the deaths occurred in a period of 14 to 15 weeks in the fall of 1918. And again, in any particular community, it was shorter period than that. Obviously, uh, COVID-19 takes a lot longer. Uh, even if we had not intervened with uh, the lockdowns to prevent transmission, uh, it still would have taken much longer to move through a community. The lockdowns, of course, while they saved a lot of lives, they are creating much more economic problems uh, than occurred in 1918. A couple of the lessons from 1918. Uh, number one, tell the truth. Uh, number two, social distancing. Uh, give you a brief history now of uh, the development of the federal policy. Uh, you, you cited Fran Townsend and you know Clinton had set somewhat of a precedent. You gotta give Tommy Thompson credit on September 11th, he was actually in a meeting on pandemic influenza uh, when the towers were struck. He initially didn't want to leave the meeting. He considered the, uh, the issue so important. Uh, my book came out, uh, Stuart Simonson, then his assistant secretary, now assistant director general of WHO, uh, read it, took it to Mike Levitt. Uh, Mike Levitt took it to Bush. And Bush got, uh, at the same time, of course, H5N1 had just uh, resurfaced and, and looked like a real threat uh, with about a 40% case mortality rate. 
uh, in the entire administration. Levitt went to almost every cabinet men member, sat down with him. Uh, Simonson lobbied the Congress. Uh, and the result was a multi-billion dollar bill uh, creating all sorts of things, including vaccine manufacturing uh, capabilities, uh, and a, also including the planning process that I had some uh, small role in. Uh, again, the, I was asked to participate because of my knowledge of events in 1918. I already mentioned the uh, two lessons, uh, social distancing and to tell the truth. Uh, those things are written into the federal plan. Uh, transparency is right at the top. And it's written into every uh, state plan, all 50 states and uh, the several territories. We knew those things would work. Clearly, it does work. Uh, got a couple of minutes left. Briefly, where are we now? Uh, will there be another wave and so forth and so on? Uh, Respiratory viruses do tend to transmit much less in the summer for two reasons. The virus survives less well uh, outside in high temperatures and equally important, maybe even more important, epidemiological. People tend to be outdoors more as opposed to indoors in, in uh, poorly ventilated rooms. But to the extent 1918 is a precedent, uh, I don't think that will have much impact the summer seasonality. Uh, the second wave started in July in Switzerland in the middle of the summer. It ended in January, 1919 in Australia. It was delayed because Australia had a uh, very rigid quarantine on arriving ships. Uh, but when it did arrive, it was dead summer in Australia. 40% of Australians uh, were infected. Uh, so summer didn't have much impact there. Uh, also, we did not really have a first wave. We intervened and we stopped it. Uh, so as of right now, my guess is somewhere between, you know, 95% and, you know, you know maybe 90, 93, 95% of the population of the country is still susceptible to the virus. Uh, so I think susceptibility will probably trump seasonality. Uh, in fact, just this morning, uh, uh, Francis Collin, the NIH director in a blog, uh, cited a recent science study that uh, comes to the same conclusion. And uh, you know, Mark Lipsick and Mike Osterholm and I uh, co-authored a, a study, not a peer-reviewed study, but we were predicting what would happen in terms of waves. Uh, the curious thing, however, and I think all of us expect a major upticks as we uh, come out of lockdown. Uh, curiously, in Georgia, that has not yet happened. Uh, obviously, that's a good thing, I, but it's also a puzzling thing. Uh, not really sure why not. Uh, I think we still expect it, and we will see. So thank you. Thanks, John. And the, the notion that susceptibility trumps seasonality is a uh, cautionary and very worrisome point to make. Um, Harvey, let me uh, go to you now. Thanks so much again for participating. John and, and Harvey, to you. Uh, Aaron, thank you. And uh, what a pleasure and privilege it is to be on the same panel with Kathleen and John. I, I have to say thank you, Aaron, for the privilege uh, to be with uh, this group. Uh, I would just like to emphasize a few points. First, uh, the COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, stands in a long string of emergent infectious diseases, as we have uh, indicated. Influenza is a rather special case because influenza resides in multiple species all the time, and it is mutating and adapting, reassorting in different species and represents a constantly varying threat to humans. But just in the last 50 years, we've seen the HIV pandemic, we've seen Zika, we've seen SARS, we've seen MERS, we've seen uh, all of these emergent infections which are zoonotic in character, moving 
from one species, animal species, to the human species. Uh, these are all very dangerous events if the virus has certain attributes. Many of us will remember, for example, the deep worry about bird flu back in the late 1990s, which was a zoonotic movement from the avian bird species into humans. And when it affected humans, it was highly lethal, but it was not easily transmitted from person to person. What was uh, particularly characteristic of the SARS-CoV-2 and what made it and makes it such a dangerous organism is that it is novel, so none of us has pre previously uh, any immunity to it. It is uh, readily transmitted from one person to another, and that transmission within the new species is a very special and important attribute. It has the long incubation period relative to the time it takes to move from any part of the world to any other part of the world. In a day, you can be anywhere to anywhere when you have an incubation period that on average is five days and can be uh, twice or even more longer, you have many opportunities for transmission within that incubation period. It is also transmitted in the asymptomatic stage. This is very important. It's estimated today that as many as 40% of the cases were infected from an asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individual. So that means any one of us could be infected, feel perfectly well, and be capable of transmitting this infection to another. And finally, it has a pattern of severity that is sufficient to cause large numbers of deaths, particularly amongst the vulnerable populations. In this instance, the older populations, those with uh, obesity, underlying chronic conditions such as diabetes, and a very interesting difference, for example, to the 2009 H1N1 influenza in the world, which was peculiarly uh, severe amongst the younger population, very unusual among influenza pandemics as the ones that you described. So each virus really has to be studied, understood, and examined in its own light. In addition to the lessons that John uh, mentioned about transparency, which is about communication, and about separation or isolation, which is really the application of a 15th century model to a 21st century disease. I would stress the importance, not only of planning, but of implementation. The biggest shortcoming, as you look back over the series of plans over the last 25 years of pandemic preparedness, is not in the defect of the plan. It's not in the absence of understanding of what needs to be done. It was not in overlooking important considerations that might pertain. It was consistently in carrying out and executing, putting in place all of the elements that are needed to adequately prepare. And the dilemma for policymakers is the uh, Scylla and Charybdis, if you will, of being alarmist or being late. And wending your way through that very treacherous balance of appearing to be uh, overly alarmist at uh, faint signals or no signals, simply history, versus uh, what you do is too little, too late, is a constant challenge to policymakers coping with emerging disease and with many other similar threats. Finally, I would just like to say that the lessons uh, that I draw from the history of dealing with emerging infection and including influenza dating back at least to the, uh, the pandemic that never was, the epidemic that never was in the 1970s, is overconfidence in meager information. Most of us, and particularly experts, 
have a lot of time to think about very few data points. And when that happens, the tendency is for individuals to become overconfident in what is going to occur or likely to occur. And that adds to the implementation challenge of decision-making under genuine uncertainty. And being able to balance and understand the facts of uncertainty that confront any situation, including the one that we're in today, and yet being able to make decisive choices that adequately respond to the level and nature of the threat. So that's the challenge that we have uh, today. Uh, we are in the midst of a great experiment, as John alluded, in opening up the uh, interactions. Keep in mind, the virus has no difference to how psychologically fatigued we are, no difference to how eager we are to get back together with our families and our friends, no difference to how desirous we are of resuming our congregations in church or attending a sporting event, the virus is simply capable of spreading person to person. And when you bring people together in proximity for longer periods of time, especially in closed spaces, especially doing things, whether it's singing or cheering or simply talking actively to one another, you increase the likelihood that this virus will spread from one person to another. And the time lag between when it begins to spread and when it is expressed in terms of hospitalizations or fatalities is a matter of weeks to a month or so. And my own expectation is we're embarked on this great experiment it actually doesn't matter exactly what the stated policy is. What matters is what individuals actually do and where they go, how much they interact, what they're doing when they're together. And we will see over time how this plays out in the US and indeed in countries around the world. Harvey, thank you. It's, a, it's the kind of... Um new set of responsibilities for civic involvement that uh, potentially poses an existential threat to every single American. It's truly a unique, unique set of circumstances. Thank you. Uh, Governor, uh, to you. Well, Aaron, thank you um, for inviting me. And like Harvey, I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, see Harvey and be on a panel with him, see you, uh, be able to um, here directly from John Barry. Um, so thank you. It's a it's a great group. Um, I guess I would I would start with a another essential element um, that I think is missing now and hopefully could be restored along the way. In addition to communication, uh, telling the truth, as John Barry said, I think um, it's building a level of trust. Uh, because a lot of what we are going to do to both move out of this current melee into hopefully a, a world where we have an effective vaccine and, and people can be um, vaccinated uh, relies on trust and relies on the fact that the citizens believe what they're hearing is accurate and correct. So it's all kind of connected. Um, and I worry a lot that that is not a platform, at least in this country, it may be in some countries, but in this country, I don't think that's a platform that we're dealing with right now. Um, I would certainly agree with the notion that, you know, the amount spent in terms of not just dollars at the federal and state and local level, but time and attention on public health is horrifyingly low. Um, at a state level, there really is no constituency for public health. I mean, none, zero. Nobody shows up in the legislature and demands that a portion of a state budget be allocated. And frankly, without CDC pushing resources into state and local governments, it, it rarely exists. There are ties to federal money that says you have to do planning exercises or you don't get your money at hospitals. You have to do this in order to do that. But it's a begrudging 
um, notion at the state and local level. And I would say the federal level is a much better. Uh, the federal government loves to react, does a poor job of setting aside resources, time and energy for things that may never happen. So we continue to find ourselves in this conundrum. No question after 9-11 uh, and with the um, Bush administration, there was an enormous um, investment in infrastructure at HHS throughout governments in putting aside money so the government could be a purchaser uh, of vaccines and countermeasures. And um, the bad news is that money's all gone. It was um, difficult to impossible to get Congress to replace it. So we are now dealing with a reactive measure as we saw uh, in the United States where something happens and then you throw money at it after the fact, you come together for special money. Um, that's a very, very dangerous place to be. And I'm hopeful that you know one of the after thoughts of this uh, event will be a very different look at future planning, future investment, and understanding that you could never get um, that much in a hole that you're never going to get out ahead of the disease. Um, you asked me to speak a bit about how, where we go from here, and um, the, the science is the science, uh, but I think we are on a tightrope, and we're on a tightrope that has no national plan which is a fairly, um, tear. so it's like a tightrope being walked with no net underneath. There is no framework. And what I see at least is individual governors trying to join with one another to make decisions that may have some regional bearing, but really frankly don't impact whether or not somebody's comfortable getting on a plane in Kansas and ending up in Boston, whether or not we can continue the kind of economic um, commerce and business that we have across lines, whether students should come from all over the country and gather in one spot in one university, whether that's in the Northeast or the Midwest or others, how we are going to congregate in a safe fashion. And I think those rules are now being tested and tried. I live in a university community, uh, currently trying an app that is going to uh, be tested and I think that's going on all over the place. But we're in a precarious period where a balance of economic reopening and um, outspurts of the disease will be calibrated and they would be different um, country to country, I mean, county to county and area to area. Um, I do think that at the state level, there is a, a dedication once again to building their own infrastructure. It has been um, an interesting operation to basically say to governors throughout the country, you're on your own, go find your supplies, go figure out your plan, go see what's going on. I am hopeful that by the time we get to some successful either medication or vaccination, we have again put in place a national framework. Um, I know from my experience in 09 and 10 that the vaccine won't come all at the same time, uh, that we will not have 330 million doses simultaneously and it won't be in the right places at the right time. We don't have an infrastructure to vaccinate everybody. We don't. So planning for that and having trust uh, in the public that first they should get a flu shot early and then they should actually get vaccinated is going to be a, a massive communication education effort that should start tomorrow and begin to talk to people about it. I'm also very, very alarmed at the United States withdrawing from the World Health Organization at a critical time, not only as the largest funder, uh, but as a critical member of medical equity in the world, making sure that uh, medicines are distributed in some sort of equitable fashion, that there's a pool of money available for developing countries. Because what we know is that if the disease is breaking out anywhere, we are still susceptible. The only way to keep Americans safe and secure is to make sure the pandemic is dealt with internationally, globally. And it is the worst time in the world for scientists not to collaborate, uh, not competitively, but collaboratively. It's a bad time to kick 
uh, foreign scientists out of the United States. It is a terrible time to withdraw from the infrastructure of the Global Health Organization. So I think we have created um, some real issues for our own country and perhaps for the world that need to be dealt with uh, very quickly. Global cooperation, investment, uh, planning, uh, to get us it, it, to the point where we have a fully vaccinated country and we are providing health resources, support and epidemiology to vaccinate the rest of the world. We're still vaccinating for polio in parts of the world, but that has you know narrowed down. We've got to take this collaboration very, very seriously or it's gonna come right back. Um, so there's a lot of work to do at the state and local level and certainly at the national level to I'm still waiting for a national framework to be developed that then people can work within in this great federation of states. We also have unpeeled the onion and the kind of health disparity discussion that we've had in intellectual terms for years and done big reports on and looked at numbers and statistics is now live and in person. And I do think one of the after action reports is not just a broad investment in public health and preparedness and pandemic response, but a rededication in this country to deal with a health system that continues to exacerbate health disparities. Governor, thank you. Just one quick point. I don't know if you saw the AP poll of a week or two ago. They asked, they polled uh, Americans on whether or not they would actually accept a vaccine. And we're not just talking about anti-vaxxers. Uh, almost 50% evidence some sort of skepticism about whether or not they would actually allow themselves to be vaccinated. Well, and I and think you've, that's you've seen trust. this with measles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, that's a terrifying place. And we're down to last year, only 45% of adults got a flu shot. So if you think about the flu season exacerbating COVID and making it more dangerous for already vulnerable populations. We need people to step up on day one and get a flu shot and then hopefully get a vaccine. Thank you. Uh, let me just say to all of our listeners, we will have a live Q and A um, where you can ask questions and to ask a question, use the live chat feature in YouTube or email us at pressoffice at ceip.org or tweet us at Carnegie Endow using the hashtag Carnegie Connects. Uh, I'm tempted to go back over the past four months, but I think there's not sure how productive a woulda, shoulda, coulda discussion would be at this point. But let me ask each of you one question. If there's one thing we didn't do in the course of the last four months that we still could do going forward within a relative, relative time of let's say six to eight to 10 months, what would that be? Harvey, can I start with you? Sure. Just the first, one, one takeaway. Well, uh, the first point of response, uh, in my opinion, is to establish a trusted, unified command structure. This speaks to the point that Kathleen alluded to and John was talking about in terms of an organized, coherent strategy. There is no way to execute any strategy in anything like a war. And if we think of this as a contest against a virus without having a unified command structure. It starts at the federal level, it extends through the states, it works simultaneously and in parallel on all of the major themes that need to be dealt with simultaneously in order to defeat this threat. And that means antivirals and treatments. It means dealing with the vaccine and preparation and vaccine acceptance. It means understanding better immunity. It means working with the public health authorities around contact tracing and isolation. It means facing up to the disparities and the differences in the burden of disease amongst our disadvantaged population. We have to do all of these things in parallel 
the best way and the single recommendation to start in my mind would be to establish that unified and trustworthy command structure. Thanks, Governor. Well, I, I would not disagree. I think we need, I mean, and when I say a plan, Harvey has just articulated that plan. It has to have all the elements. You have to tell people, and it has to have a very significant communication component where scientists talk about the science, not politicians. Politicians talk about the rest of government and we call upon everyone to participate and make it clear that without a uniform willingness to participate, uh, both we will continue to have economic loss and the loss of life, but it has to have a communication strategy that is repeated over and over again, that the same facts are known by the same group of people and that they are articulated by whoever can get it across most effectively and build, I think, the trust. I, I you know, I think uh, President Obama was famous for saying, we've got to tell people what we know, but more importantly, we've got to tell them what we don't know. And I think the public can take bad news or indifferent news, what they, what they get very skeptical about is made up news. So we need facts and we need to tell them this is still uncertain and we'll tell you as soon as we know. Thank you. John, does 1918 to 1920 uh, hold uh, a preeminent lesson on this question for us? Well, I think I've already addressed that. And on the one hand, I'd agree with uh, uh, both Harvey and the governor as to what would be nice, but I take a little bit different approach because I think those recommendations, as much as I agree with them and that they are the number one thing needed, in the real world, they would require Trump not to be Trump. And Trump is Trump. So I think what could be done realistically is having states, and they are in the process of doing this, but they're not there yet, uh, get ahead on the, on the testing, contact tracing, isolation, and so forth. Uh, you know, as I said, 100% agree what is needed is, you know, has already been articulated by both other panelists but Trump's not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, so the states are taking more of a leadership role than they ever imagined they would have to take. And I need, they, I think they, they do need to get more into it than they are. We do need a public uh, health army for, Aaron, for contact tracing. I just want to ask John a question because I think sure. this is fascinating. And as a former a governor, I, I, don't disagree that, that those coalitions are being formed with the vacuum at the top. I, I wonder what your view is though, if the coalitions form along similar lines and we still have, I don't see a great uniformity yet in governor. I mean, if you had all 50 right. governors speaking on the same playbook and using the same, I, I would totally agree that that's a great substitute but that's not what we have. And I wonder how you see getting to a level where we actually have some uniform. Well, you know, we, as you know, there's some regionalization in the Northeast. Yeah. Uh, obviously in, in red states, it's more difficult, uh, if not impossible. Uh, but I was really speaking to what, you know, state by state, they, we can do something. You know, Trump is not gonna okay. take the advice you know, to the extent it's regionalized is better. Uh, yeah. But, you know, things aren't going to happen that uh, without leadership and we're not having it. We have, as Harvey said, incredible, actually didn't quite say it, but he implied it, unbelievable incoherence. Uh, unbelievable. You know, John, you pointed out in the great influenza the difference between Philadelphia and St. Louis with respect to community spread, referring to parades and bottom, and mobilization during the, the last year of the First World War and with bond drives. Do any of you believe, uh, or how serious is the uh, possibility of, of uh, intensive community spread as a consequence of what we've seen over the course of the last week uh, as a result of the killing of um, 
of George Floyd and what's resulted now in over 130 American cities. Does that pose a significant threat of resurgence? Well, yeah, I, I would think so. And my guess is, you know, Kathleen and Harvey agree. Uh, we had that threat anyway, because I don't think uh, almost every state was, you know, none of them met the, all the guidelines uh, to come out of reopening anyway. Uh, Aaron, yeah, do you I'm mean, sure. be, excuse me, Aaron, do you mean because of the gatherings, the gatherings. of large numbers of yeah, people? Is I mean, that what you're referring to? Right. I mean, Harvey, you referred to the basic 15th century proposition of quarantine. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, first, uh, some of the of the demonstrations, you see people that are uh, wearing masks. Uh, yes, they are close together, but they're moving in an outdoor space. Uh, comparatively speaking, the highest risk is in closed indoor spaces with people uh, singing, shouting, uh, etc. So. You wouldn't want to be uh, in a basketball auditorium. You wouldn't want to be uh, at a choir. You wouldn't want to be indoor at all. Outdoors, it can happen that you have mass transmissions, but keep in mind you also have a huge dilution of any uh, viral uh, aerosol uh, very rapidly in an outdoor space. In fact, one of the most important preventives and management for indoor spaces is to increase airflow, air exchange, so that you dilute more rapidly uh, the uh, concentration of, uh, of inhalable virus. So uh, yes, I'm worried about these uh, gatherings. I'm more worried about the parties where people are just gathered together to celebrate around uh, you know, the barbecue or in the pool uh, talking to one another, embracing, uh, those are much more dangerous than uh, walking. I don't like seeing people shouting in the faces of, uh, of others. That's a pretty dangerous thing to do from the point of view of, of, uh, of the virus. So, you know, you, the key here to me is you have to separate altogether the justification, the motivation, the desirability of being together, whether it's for your family, for your church, for your sporting event, for your protest, it, if the virus is indifferent to the reason that you're near one another. And so uh, you just look at the risk factors. Outdoor is less risky than indoor. Wearing a mask, less risky than not wearing a mask larger numbers of people, more risky than smaller numbers of people. And it applies to um, highly motivated, even necessary protests uh, as it would apply to any other gathering of a susceptible and a potentially infected individual. Thank you. Um, you know, this may not be the the most severe crisis in American history, but it has to be the most unique one. I, I don't, I'm looking back over 200 plus years, I can't, I mean, there hasn't been a crisis in which every single American, everyone uh, is potentially affected by an unseen invisible virus that could pose an existential threat uh, to their well being. Ordinary objects, countertops, doorknobs are turned into, you know, hostile adversaries of it all, you know, as a close friend of mine pointed out, we now have the great influenza of 1918 combined with depression-like economic meltdown in 1929, combined with some of the worst uh, social and civil unrest that we've seen since the late 1960s. So you have 1918, 1929, and 1968 all combined into one. My question is, is there, it's hard for me to conceive that any administration um, could afford to go back to sleep with respect to the threat that infectious disease and pandemic pose. Do you think we've reached an inflection point? Or if there is a vaccine, is this all simply going to go away and the priorities of re redefining priorities uh, can somehow not occur? I mean, we are America the unprepared and we forget 
very quickly once we manage to fix something uh, or sweep it under the rug. Well, we're all being polite and waiting for yeah. someone else to answer. Why doesn't the governor go? Well, I don't know that there's any brilliant answer. I'm hopeful that finally you, unfortunately this connects a lot of dots. This health crisis has produced an economic crisis which not only affects everybody, but sort of double everybody. And I think that message um, might have been hard to deliver any other way. In the woulda, coulda, shoulda, this might happen, we gotta get prepared, this could happen to you. Uh, the economics of this crisis, I think, are, are more likely to drive investment to prevent that from happening again, unfortunately, than the health side, but it may actually spur the health side. I mean, we have a whole food safety system, for instance, it's really based on the fact that uh, if you recall a food, it knocks a whole industry out for a while. And then, you know, there is investment in food safety and investment in prevention. Um, somehow the economics may be a bigger driver than the health impact, although we've never had a situation like this where the health impact can be kind of uniform across the board. But the combination, I mean, if we don't get it after this, I don't have any idea what will make people insist that, I mean, and it's basically an insistence that with limited resources, you have to allocate resources for defense. And um, the way we buy missiles and get armies together to do exercises in case something happens. I mean, we have to do that in public health and this may be the call to action. We have a question from uh, Finley, Finley B, who's asking on YouTube. I think Harvey, this may be one for you. What do epidemiologists think? This is intriguing. And the reason for the lack of a spike in cases after opening after certain openings, you referred to Georgia as an example, and what could this mean for the future trajectory of the pandemic? Is there a, I mean, are there, there may be no exact answer, maybe too early, but is there a way to identify some elements here as to why there hasn't been or inevitably will be? Uh, the first is, again, the variability of the circumstances in different, uh, in different communities. Uh, a second factor to keep in mind is variability in testing, which is variability in detecting what is actually going on. So there's a difference between what may be actually happening and uh, what we are detecting and measuring. The third is uh, what the statisticians call the lag effect which is the lagging indicator when you are looking for something that represents or reflects an event that occurred days or weeks earlier. So if what you're tracking are hospitalizations and you say the hospitalizations haven't gone up uh, and we've already been out for a week, the answer is it would take on average two weeks for hospitalizations to go up. It takes on average three to four weeks for mortality to go up based on events that started happening three to four weeks earlier. So the first part of this is you have to allow time to uh, elapse. Uh, the second is that uh, circumstances vary by uh, specifics of interaction in a community. It only takes, for example, one super spreader event that would occur in a place of work at a school. There was just a report uh, from uh, Israel, for example, the other day of a school, a high school, in which a single adult uh, infected more than 175 people in this school, uh, including 125 of the students. We've had the experience in our uh, meatpacking plants. We had the early experience uh, at a choir practice in uh, Washington State. So a single super spreader event can uh, be the spark that then really moves a community into a dangerous period. And finally, if you just think about the dynamics of a geometrically multiplying event, one, two, four, eight, 
16. You can go through a number of generations where the total numbers appear to be relatively small or below your threshold of detection, and then it explodes. Mm. So uh, we have to be very cautious again in over-interpreting what we see within a few weeks of a change in practice and behavior. Uh, time will tell. Thanks. Uh, John, I think this one's for you. Uh, Charles K has asked over email, how did the 1918 pandemic end? And what, if anything, does this tell us about the trajectory of the current uh, pandemic? Oh, uh, first, uh, they are different viruses, so I'm not sure how much of a precedent it would be. Uh, I would guess two things. Number one, the virus continued to mutate and probably became less lethal. In addition, people's immune systems uh, came to recognize it. It was initially uh, quite unusual. And as the, your immune system gets more and more familiar with it, it's, it's able to deal with it. Uh, let me uh, say one thing about uh, that may be a precedent in terms of public health investment. Uh, it wasn't until 1928 that NIH was, was founded. Uh, you would have thought after the 1918 pandemic, Congress would have invested some money uh, into public health, but it didn't. There was a resurgence of influence in 1928 that reminded everyone uh, that uh, it was pretty serious. And, and that led to the founding of NIH. You know, going forward, the government, every government is going to have more fiscal problems than it has ever faced before. Uh, both state and, and federal. Uh, so, you know, you would think it would be obvious that they would invest in public health monitoring uh, for emerging pathogens and so forth and so on, which you you're in your opening comments referred to. Uh, but I don't know that it's a guarantee or if it is that, that it will last uh, just as that Bush initiative ended up petering out. Thank you. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that within five years of that outbreak in 1928, they actually, for the first time, were able to identify the actual strain of the virus. Of the yeah, that came about the, yeah, in the, yeah, in the uh, 30s by, they didn't know what a virus was in 1918, right. whether it was just a tiny bacteria or whether it was an entirely different organism. Uh, 1925, they figured that out. And then in the mid thirties, they did identify the influenza virus. You know, Aaron, to John's point, because we're, we're talking hopefully about the future and what it might look like. The, um, there was a pretty, I think, exciting initiative, a big step taken in the global community. The United States participated, but we didn't want to own it because we thought it would cause other, some other countries to be skeptical, but a very concerted global health security focus um, that involved kind of developed countries, adopting developing countries. The plan was to train epidemiologists and, and literally have them placed in regions around the world for rapid response and shared information and I think by the end of the last administration, there were about 70 nations who had signed on to either be um, donors or recipients and a very collaborative structure. It has been somewhat dismantled, but that structure, I think, lends itself to you know, a restart and a focus because it is really global in nature and the notion that you have to begin the epidemiology at the point of origin and as fast as you can put trained folks on the ground and figure out what's going on and share samples and get a vaccine. I mean, all of that network is, there's an infrastructure there that did not exist um, in prior years that could be restarted, uh, which is somewhat a hopeful, a hopeful sign that the United States would re-engage in that. Right, we just have to be wise enough um, and smart enough to take advantage. One would help, but we don't have to start from scratch is all I wanted to say. No, I, I agree. Uh, Harvey, I think I heard you uh, on a California radio station talk a little bit about vaccines, what's real and what isn't. 
I wonder if you could take us to school just for a minute or two um, and um, put this issue in perspective. Vaccines. Uh, there are so many critical elements to uh, vaccine development. Uh, right now, there are literally hundreds of candidate vaccines. There are a number uh, now, more than 10, that have entered at some stage of human trials. Uh, there are some steps that can be taken to accelerate uh, what is a traditional development model for vaccines. The vaccine model, which depends on individual companies, typically proceeds step by step in which a company would not make a major investment in a uh, phase three, this is an efficacy trial, for example, unless a phase two study had been successful, the dosage had been properly uh, accomplished and based on phase one safety studies that the vaccines had been safe. Uh, but if the government is, as it is doing, willing to put money into the preparation for each of the successive stages of testing and around capacity for manufacturing before we actually know which technological platform of vaccine, and there are a number of different uh, vaccine technologies that are in development. If we put in place those capacities as a kind of insurance scheme, knowing that some of them will be wasted and maybe none of them will work, but if there is a candidate, we will be able to move much more aggressively on production of the vaccine. Uh, and then we get to the problems of distribution. I think it was uh, uh, Governor Sebelius who, who spoke uh, before about the problem of distribution uh, of the vaccine and the sequencing of the distribution. And then on top of that, you have the problem of vaccine acceptance that we've also alluded to and hesitancy. And this points to a really strong dilemma, uh, Aaron, in public health, which is the balance between exposing all of the uncertainty to the public, which the governor said you have to do, but then understanding that this could provoke reasonable questioning on the part of a public who now understands that this is more uncertain than usual or more uh, hurriedly developed than usual. So it's going to be incumbent on uh, the vaccine authorities that's in government and in the private sector to have assurance to the public about the completeness of testing for both safety and effectiveness the independence of validation, the assurance about the purity and safety of the production in the usual way that the FDA traditionally has insisted upon, and adequate field trials that document up to a degree because a field trial cannot be in millions of people, it's in thousands. So if you have rare but severe side effects, that occur one per million, you're not going to find that in your first trial. So that means you also need post-market surveillance as a part of the strategy. Mm. And after you've done all of this, we are still going to have the problem and the challenge of setting priorities, distributing the vaccine, deploying it, overcoming vaccine hesitancy, and the deeper worry some of uh, public health authorities have is that if the COVID-19 vaccine is not executed and developed more or less perfectly, it will reverberate against vaccine acceptance on established necessary vaccines, for example, for the childhood conditions of measles, mumps, and rubella. So these are all part of the vaccine challenge right now. To come back to the question which is often on people's mind, can you have a vaccine by the end of the year? Uh, it depends what you mean by have. If you mean a candidate that's in 
uh, trial, yes, we, you, you could be pretty sure we're gonna have candidates. If you mean a vaccine already documented as safe and effective, already manufactured at a scale and already ready to be administered to the priority populations, much less to the whole of the population, that is a really tall order. And right. my personal estimate is if you're talking about this in the calendar of 2020, uh, that can't be higher than a 20% likelihood of success. But finally, keep in mind, there's always the chance that none of these vaccines will actually be protective. Uh, th this is an uncertainty. It is a new virus. We know that you can be infected with a COVID cold virus every year. If a vaccine or even natural infection is only protective for a period of months and not for a period of years, do you become vulnerable again after a season? All of these are unknowns at this time and will need to play out over time. So uh, that's uh, two minutes on the state of vaccine. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we've come to the end of the hour and I have to commend the three of you. I mean, you've kept the discussion at an incredibly high level. We've avoided politics, um, which I think to some degree is important. Um, having voted for Republicans and Democrats and worked for them, um, however, um, I, I just want to close by reading a short paragraph, which is the last paragraph of John Barry's book, which I think gets to the interaction between public trust and leadership. And here's what John Barry says to conclude this extraordinary book. I mean, I'm not doing commercials for John Barry, but The Great Influenza really is an extraordinary, extraordinary book. So here's what John Barry says. So the final lesson of 1918 a pandemic that took between 50 and 100 million lives around the world and at least 675,000 and originated, they think, if I'm correct, John, in, in Kansas. So the final lesson of 1918, a simple one, yet one most difficult to execute, is that those who occupy positions of authority must lessen the panic that can alienate all within a society. Society cannot function if it is every man for himself. By definition, civilization cannot survive that. Those in authority must retain the public's trust. The way to do that is to distort nothing, to put the best face on nothing, to try to manipulate no one. Lincoln said it first, and he said it best. A leader must make whatever horror exists concrete, only then will people be able to break it apart. I want to thank um, John and Harvey Governor Sebelius for your economy of language, your authority, your wisdom, your insights. Um, I learned a ton. It was a great session. Uh, thanks again. And uh, I hope all of you will tune in to the next uh, session of Carnegie Connects. Thanks again. <laughs>